I've been with this woman for 10 years, and we didn't know who she was. This is a story of prostitution and murder. They thought for the last three years that a killer had been charged. It's a terrible situation. An investigation that stretched more than a decade and a grave with no name. Investigators delayed evidence and a confession investigators claimed came from the man who did it. He was able to corroborate information from the crime scene. We uncover the truth with the I-20 girls case. It's ended with a resignation and a cold case is heating up. But at any point did you or anyone in your office go, well, why don't we have this file yet? Has this person been charged? We try to let law enforcement do their job. This is a WIS investigation special report. This is the story of the I-20 girl. Tonight, WIS is launching a new franchise called SC Missing. We're looking into missing person cases, looking for new leads that could shed light on missing person cases. Tonight, a 14-year-old case that turned into a murder investigation. It happened in Darlington County in 2000. Our investigation uncovered a man accused of murder was never charged. And the detective handling the case resigned after we started asking questions. Our lead investigative reporter, Jody Barr, kicks off our SC Missing series tonight with the I-20 girl. The case started with a woman's body found dumped at a rest area in 2000. She went unidentified for 11 years and her suspected killer still has not faced charges. This is that rest area along I-20 where that woman's body was found. Investigators say she was murdered by a trucker. Her body dumped in the woods here in the summer of 2000. That woman's become known as the I-20 girl. We found out during our investigation there were never any criminal charges filed against the man investigators say committed this murder. Also, while we were looking into this case, the lead investigator resigned. And for the first time in 14 years, a prosecutor is getting his first look at this case file. For more than a decade, a woman lay in this Darlington County Cemetery. No one knew her name. The county coroner gave her a funeral, but for 11 years, he had no name on the marker. Asphyxia due to strangulation. Eldridge Norton was coroner when Lee County dispatchers got a 911 call from an anonymous trucker. The trucker reported he found a body at a rest area. It was this Interstate 20 rest stop in Darlington County. The body, the trucker said, was in the woods on the westbound side. Do you remember when you got to the scene what you saw? She was probably 150 yards off of a uh, park uh, where people pulled in a rest stop and uh, of course she was lying face down and had been there probably uh, 30 days at least. This was uh, somewhat the scene uh, back in 2000 when we first uh, received a call from 911 dispatcher in ben uh, Bishopville. Darlington County Sheriff's Captain Andy Locklear, a rookie, was the lead investigator. He admitted. I got handed the case. It was, I was working this area uh, at that time. The case was the biggest case of his career. In August 2000, Locklear was sitting inside the sheriff's office when the call came out about the body. When you hear, you know, they got a body in the woods, I mean, it's one of those things where a lot of people's going to show up. You know, it's going to be a major crime scene. Investigators taped off the crime scene and sled agents processed the evidence. The woman was face down, partially covered in pine straw, and investigators say her bra and a wire was twisted around her neck. As investigators cleared the scene, Locklear was left to put it all together. At the end of that first 48 hours, we, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any fingerprints. We didn't have any, because of the de decomposition of the body, we didn't have any identifying marks or anything of such uh, that would help us. Um, I mean, we were, we were behind the eight ball with this case uh, early on. Investigators dubbed the case the I-20 girl. Sled agents used the woman's skull to reconstruct her face, then sat back and waited for a break to find out who this woman was. Investigators knew early in the investigation it would take some short of a miracle to solve it. And you're thinking, you know, like you would any other case, it's all going to fall into place and we'll start getting information, it'll start coming in and, and, uh, and go that route. And, uh, you know, it just didn't happen that way with this case. How important was it for you to identify who this woman was? Well, you know, I always felt like uh, she belonged to somebody. I 
just took interest in it, wanted to keep looking. Eldridge Norton spent the next 11 years working to put a name with a file he still holds on to today. In 2001, Norton decided not to run again. On his last day in office, he buried the unidentified woman. She was the only mystery from Norton's two decades long career. Saw many of them in 20 years. Uh, this uh, was the only unidentified person that I had had in 20 years. The coroner took the body to the pathologist. Doctors found the woman was strangled. The weapon was some sort of wire. Investigators admit they still don't know exactly what the wire is. As Darlington County worked on the criminal case, work was also underway to identify the woman. The pathologist took DNA samples. It looked like the only way investigators would get a positive ID. She could have been from anywhere. Uh, when you're talking about finding her in a wooded area off of an interstate, it doesn't mean that they're local, and by chance she probably would not have been local. Sled's composite went public. Investigators hoped someone recognized the face. A year slipped by, then another, and another. It wasn't long before the I-20 girl's case went cold. The information slowly ceases, and you start getting one every six months, an inquiry. And then somebody will run across the missing website and they'll have somebody on there. And, um, and you, you know, you start getting a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and then, and then that's it. Although this case turned cold and the lead slowed to nothing, there was still one person investigators wanted to talk to. Remember that anonymous trucker who called 911? Well, he never hung around to show investigators what he found. He didn't even show them where he found that woman's body. Investigators tried to find this man, Darlington County, went as far to call him a person of interest. To this day, investigators have never found that anonymous trucker. One more lead has dried up. It, it was suspicious to us uh, when it first happened, um, to the point where you know we looked uh, to try to find who he was. That was the first thing we did. Coming up, he looked, sat back in his chair, and uh, he actually said at first, he said, my DNA ain't on that wire, because I strangled her with my shirt. A confession from a convicted killer led deputies to name a suspect, but parts of that confession didn't match the facts in the case. In August of 2000, Darlington County investigators opened a homicide investigation after someone murdered a woman, then dumped her body in these woods at this Interstate 20 rest area. Investigators thought the killer might be a truck driver. What investigators did not know, however, was who this woman was. They had even less of an idea of who killed her. You know, we had a, a bunch of questions, but we didn't have a whole lot of answers. Darlington County investigator Andy Locklear got the case in August 2000. Locklear had a few pieces, a body, a potential murder weapon, DNA evidence, but not much else. Our investigation found delays in the case from the start. A letter from investigators in 2011 shows Darlington County did not submit DNA from the woman's body until 2005, five years after her death. That sample sat in a Texas DNA lab for six more years, waiting on deputies to find a match. While detectives waited, a call from the Brunswick County Sheriff's Office gave Darlington County its first potential break. Investigators there told Locklear a trucker named John Wayne Boyer could be the killer. Boyer was serving time in a North Carolina prison on a second-degree murder conviction. He pleaded guilty to killing a woman he knew. They had already you know, suspected this guy and what he had done. So with what he done, I started explaining my crime scene down here. And it's like, dude, that's the same thing we have up here. So this guy could be the same guy. And... Um, you know, we went from there. Brunswick County went through missing persons files and in 2008 ran across the cold case file of Michelle Hagedon. She could be a match, investigators thought. The composite Locklear had sure seemed to match. Investigators tracked down Kathleen Applegate, Michelle Hagedon's mother. They asked her for a DNA sample to compare. Do you remember how long that took? Over two years. Did you ever tell you why it took so long? They kept it a secret the whole time. From the time they did the DNA, I never knew that they even had the results back. And <clears throat> I, would, I would ask, and I got no answer. Applegate gave DNA in 2008, but her family had to resubmit. 
Applegate's grandson submitted a second sample the following year. Then in 2010, Michelle Hagedon's sister, Tuesday, gave her DNA to investigators. One year later, the lab sent investigators notice the body was Michelle Hagedon. Applegate's family's DNA was a perfect match. Did you still believe at that time she was alive? And no. Dead? No. In my heart, I knew she was dead. A mother knows. I felt she had been dead for quite a few years. Coming up, investigators claim they had a confession, but could it support a charge? You know, he finally, just in a braggadocious kind of way, just admitted to, yeah, you know, yeah, I killed her. But our investigation found investigators never charged the man they accused of murder. And the lead investigator resigns after we discovered what the sheriff calls a cover-up in the case. It was a deal of sex for cash, and investigators say paired Michelle Hagedon up with John Wayne Boyer. This is where investigators say that deal went down, where they say Boyer murdered the woman who has become known as the I-20 girl and dumped her body in the woods at this I-20 rest area. What we've uncovered is investigators haven't even taken the first steps to file formal charges in this case. Michelle Hagedon was 34 when investigators say she was working as a prostitute, working an I-95 truck stop in Dillon County. Investigators think she got into a truck with a man named John Wayne Boyer. Darlington County Sheriff's Captain Andy Locklear says he got a confession from Boyer weeks before holding this press conference in September 2011. Locklear told reporters Boyer admitted everything. You could sense the narcissistic attitude that he had. So, you know, I've always been a, a pretty good interviewer. And uh, I just, just let him talk, let him brag, let him do what he's going to do and, uh, and go from there. During the interview, Locklear says he realized he had nothing else on Boyer, no physical evidence, no witnesses, no video, nothing to put Boyer with the victim. A confession was his only hope. When I first walked in, you know, it was almost like, you know, what, what girl do you want to talk about now? Or what woman do you want to talk about now? Using the you know, uh, explicit language there. And Darlington County's top investigator told us Boyer tried to provoke detectives, tried to get the upper hand, but Locklear had a plan. He decided to trick John Wayne Boyer. I said, and I have, uh, I have two cards in my hand, but I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to show you one of them. And it's a, just a pure bluff, like you would have in the actual game of Texas Hold'em. And I, I said, why would your DNA be on this uh, wire, which was what was used uh, to strangle uh, this person. And uh, he looked, sat back in his chair, and uh, he actually said at first, he said, my DNA ain't on that wire because I strangled her with my shirt. And to, to one-up me, he actually confessed uh, to killing her. But the alleged confession did not match the documented crime scene evidence. Remember the coroner's report. It shows the woman was strangled with a wire, not a shirt. Was Boyer confessing to the Hagedon murder? Could the confession support a charge? The bluff from law enforcement was that this victim was killed with a wire. Right. The supposed mm -hmm. killer tells him, no, I killed her with a t-shirt. Does that in and of itself pose a problem? Well, it poses a problem because you, you would expect that if you're getting a confession from someone, their confession would match uh, facts that you know from the crime scene. Columbia defense attorney Jack Swirling is an expert in criminal defense. The confession, Swirling says, would have a hard time convincing a jury John Wayne Boyer was the killer. And the fact that somebody's admitting to doing something but saying it was done by a whole different way than your, you know evidence and you have forensic evidence that supports it, you know, that's a clear contradiction. With that confession, Locklear gathered the I-20 girl's family, called reporters, and announced they had the killer. That was September 2011. Locklear went as far as to call John Wayne Boyer a serial killer. At the time, Boyer only pleaded guilty to one murder. He was indicted in a second. Locklear said then he was getting a murder warrant for Boyer and preparing the case for trial. It was a major relief for Kathleen Applegate. She had found her daughter, and the man who's accused of killing her would soon pay. So to this day, you believe... The, the man who killed your daughter, based off of what the sheriff's office told you, is behind bars and prepared to face justice in this case. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Sheriff's Captain Andy Locklear promised charges in this case. He made that promise two years, seven months ago. Last month, we came here to the Darlington County Courthouse to take a look at the John Wayne Boyer murder warrant. Turns out it doesn't exist. We went to the Darlington County file room searching every file from 2011. We never found one on John Wayne Boyer. The promise Captain Locklear made Michelle Hagedon's family in 2011, he never kept. If I told you today that there are no charges pending against him, no indictment, no warrant, would that surprise you? That would be devastating. He's taken the life of somebody I loved. And, um, no, that wouldn't be right. Without a charge, do you really have a killer? That raised a concern with us. Well, yes. Police are not doing their job. We went back to Locklear two weeks ago to find out what happened. Has he been indicted here in Darlington County? He has not been indicted in Darlington County. But to not have that indictment here, do you believe the family of Michelle Hagedon will be satisfied knowing that the accused killer in their case is not even charged for her murder? Well, the accused killer in the case is charged. It's just not a formal charge. Locklear was telling the truth, but he did something one week before this interview that no one knew about. Captain Locklear, the next business day after he found out we had interviewed Michelle Hagedon's mother, went to a county judge and swore out a murder warrant on Boyer. Locklear told the judge he had new information in the case and was ready to charge, something he promised to do more than two and a half years before. Last week, Locklear resigned after the sheriff found out we were investigating what Locklear did to get that warrant. Darlington County Sheriff Wayne Bird wrote in a statement that Locklear failed to follow procedure and attempting to cover up that fact. The day after our interview, Locklear turned in his gun, badge, and cleaned out his police truck, which is now sitting in a county impound lot. The I-20 girls case, 14 years later, never seen by prosecutors. Sitting here today, though, there is no criminal case file in your office dealing with a John Wayne Boyer. We have never received any charging documents from law enforcement. After our investigation, the I-20 girls file gets new life. Before we ever sat down with 4th Circuit Solicitor Will Rogers to talk about the prosecution of the I-20 girls case, the solicitor told me he knew very little about it. Turns out 14 years after this homicide happened in Darlington County, the Sheriff's Office never delivered their case file to the solicitor. Sitting here today though, there is no criminal case file in your office dealing with a John Wayne Boyer. We have never received any charging documents from law enforcement. Three years earlier, Darlington County Sheriff's Captain Andy Locklear told reporters he would have murder warrants on John Wayne Boyer. That did not happen until two weeks ago, right after we interviewed the victim's mother. When we sat down with Solicitor Will Rogers two weeks ago, he could not tell us much about the case. He admitted his office did not follow up on charges after Locklear's 2011 press conference identifying Boyer as the killer. Rogers was the chief prosecutor at the time, a job he still holds today. Were you aware that a press conference had been held and that a, you know, at that point a homicide case was open in your county? Well, I've, I've been aware of the case. Um, now, I can't sit here and say I'm aware of the, the circumstances of the um, press conference and all that, uh, but I've been aware of the case. But at any point, did you or anyone in your office go, well, why don't we have this file yet? Has this person been charged? And yeah. let's see, you know, some administration of justice. Well, we try to let law enforcement do their job. Kathleen Applegate told us she's angry with Darlington County investigators after finding out a promise for justice was not kept. It's a cold case. Why would they care? You know, they're busy, you know, doing their people who doing drugs and, you know, killing people in the gangs and stuff. So she wasn't important to them. They would interview the missing persons file one time a year. Is that acceptable to the mother of a child? Absolutely not. Kathleen Applegate spent 11 years wondering what happened to her daughter. She says the relief is knowing her daughter is home and that once unnamed headstone finally has a name. What was worse, the news that she had, was missing for a decade or the news that she had been killed? I, I think the missing. 
because with the death there is closure. And she's buried in a beautiful spot. I think the not knowing is the worst because now I know where she's at. I know where she's buried. I know I can go there anytime I want to. And uh, not knowing is, is tough. It can make you sick. Well, this story isn't over. The solicitor who told us in the beginning he knew very little about this case has reopened this file and assigned an assistant solicitor to this case. The solicitor also told me he plans to make a final decision on whether he'll charge John Wayne Boyer after all once his office finishes reviewing the case. We could have a decision on that by the end of the week. Last month, we aired a special report on a 14-year-old murder case in Darlington County. After our report, the solicitor there reopened the case. The man accused of murder was never charged. Only after our investigation started did investigators go get a warrant. Tonight, investigative reporter Jody Barr has new developments in that investigation of the I-20 girl case. Well, we've got some major developments since this report first aired last month. The solicitor's office has gone back through the entire case file, reinvestigating this case from the very start. A little more than a week ago, the solicitor sent Darlington County investigators to North Carolina to go back through the original missing persons case for the I-20 girl. The missing persons report was filed in 2000 after Michelle Hagadon went missing. It is the first time the county's made the trip to North Carolina to conduct any investigation in this case. We started working on this case months ago and found this man. He's the lone witness in the I-20 girl case and tells a story that puts accused killer John Wayne Boyer and the I-20 girl together. Hours before investigators think she was murdered. Whenever we got to this point in South Carolina, the 192 mile marker, I spotted a car broke down. It was a little girl in a car. And she was standing on the opposite side. And she was standing up against that guardrail up there, if you can see that guardrail. I said, look, there's a car broke down up here. And uh, when I looked back in the mirror, he was putting on brakes. That morning he showed up and he was wanting to go ahead of me after I had gotten there first. And I told him, no way, man. I said, I got here first. I'm unloading first. But he was all agitated. And I seen his like forehead was sweating. And when I come back through from Texas two days later, her car was still sitting there. Investigators, this same story in 2011, Darlington County investigators still have not interviewed this man as part of their murder investigation into the I-20 girls case. The solicitor also tell, tells me he's ordering new interviews in this case and reviewing all the physical evidence SLED collected in 2000. Coming up at 7, we'll lay all these new developments out for you in a special report. New developments in a WIS investigation. Major procedural changes are in place after we started digging into a 14-year-old murder case in Darlington County. Last month, we aired a special report into the I-20 girl murder case. Investigators think a trucker murdered a woman in 2000, then dumped her body in the woods at an Interstate 20 rest stop in Darlington County. We uncovered multiple mistakes and unexplained delays in the Sheriff's Office handling of the case. Tonight, lead investigative reporter Jody Barr is in Darlington County to explain what's changed with how that county handles cases now. Well, those delays and later what turned out to be a cover-up could have this case in such a position as to where it may never reach trial here in Darlington County. Since we broke this investigation last month, the Sheriff's Office changed its policies and the way it handles murder investigations here in Darlington County. And the judge who signed this murder warrant told me he's changing the way he does things in his office too. To not have that charge here, Tennessee is indicted already. They did that years ago. But to not have that indictment here, do you believe the family of Michelle Hagedon will be satisfied knowing that the accused killer in their case is not even charged for her murder? Well, the accused killer in the case is charged. It's just not a formal charge. Darlington County Sheriff's Captain Andy Locklear told us that in this interview the day before he resigned last month. Locklear was supposed to get a murder warrant in 2011 for the man he accused of killing the I-20 girl. 
Two and a half years passed and Locklear never got the warrant until days before we aired our investigation into his case. The sheriff called what Locklear so did to get that warrant a cover-up. The Darlington County Sheriff's Office still has not served accused killer John Wayne Boyer with that warrant. He isn't formally charged with the killing until deputies serve him. Notified North Carolina that, that we have pending charges on him. You know, the, the warrant's not been served, um, and it won't be served until we're ready to bring him back. Darlington County Sheriff Wayne Bird told our sister station that last week. The sheriffs refused to interview with us about this case since we opened our investigation months ago. Bird was at the press conference in 2011 when Locklear told Michelle Hagedon's family and the public he'd have warrants on Boyer. We wanted to know from the sheriff what he did to make sure that happened. Have a good day, Jody. Sources tell us Bird called a meeting with his staff to issue new policies to keep what happened in the I-20 girl case from ever happening again. Bird never returned our calls to tell us what that plan would be. Uh, but that's, you know, really that's, that's what we're going to have to do. You just got to follow up and make sure that, that the work's getting done. The magistrate who signed off on Boyer's murder warrant in March declined an interview with us. The judge explained that he signed the warrant for Locklear after the former captain swore under oath and gave the judge an affidavit, claiming he had new information in the Hagedon case. After we explained to the judge that we'd questioned Locklear months before about this case and were about to air a series into Locklear's failures to bring charges, the judge put in place changes in his office. From now on, the judge said, he'll keep all affidavits in his office when law enforcement asks for a warrant. Well, those changes, according to Darlington County officials, are in place right now, and they are here to stay. As for that warrant on John Wayne Boyer, Darlington County Sheriff's Office still has not served it. Coming up, we'll tell you why the county won't serve that warrant and why one legal expert says there is absolutely no excuse for not charging this accused killer. In Darlington County, Jody Varr, WIS News 10. An update now on a WIS investigation going on three years. An accused killer in the I-20 girl murder case in Darlington County is still not charged. In September 2011, Darlington County Captain Andy Locklear accused John Wayne Boyer of killing Michelle Hagedon, then dumping her body at an I-20 rest stop. For two and a half years, Locklear never did anything to get a warrant against Boyer until we started asking questions. With the case in potential jeopardy, the sheriff says he still is not in a hurry to charge the man his office accused of murder. Lead investigative reporter Jody Barr has more from the I-20 rest stop and tells us why the county has no plans to charge John Wayne Boyer anytime soon. Well, the best explanation we've gotten so far is that John Wayne Boyer won't be going anywhere anytime soon. Boyer's currently serving time in a North Carolina prison on a separate murder conviction there. From North Carolina, he then heads to Tennessee to face trial on a second separate murder charge. But here in Darlington County, where this I-20 rest area is, the sheriff here says he won't serve Boyer with this murder warrant until he's good and ready. In 2007, John Wayne Boyer pleaded guilty to second-degree murder after he admitted to killing a woman he knew in Wilmington. Boyer admitted he and Scarlett Wood were doing drugs in a hotel when he said something made him angry. Boyer told the judge he killed her and dumped her body in the woods. Boyer got 12 years for that. His sentence ends in July 2015. Well, once you serve warrant on somebody, it sets in the process a certain schedule, you might say, of, of events, things that have to take place legally. Darlington County Sheriff Wayne Birds refused to interview with us about this case since we started investigating it months ago. Bird agreed to interview with our Myrtle Beach sister station last week about it. The sheriff blamed his former captain, Andy Locklear, for the reasons the sheriff's office never got a warrant on Boyer until we started asking questions. Well, that didn't even match the, the particulars of the crime. Locklear resigned the day after we shot this interview with him in March. Whatever faults or whatever mistakes he may have made, uh, really, they were his mistakes. They don't 
affect the, the case itself. Bird claims Boyer isn't going anywhere anytime soon as the reason he's not in any hurry to serve the murder warrant. Notified North Carolina that, that we have pending charges on him. You know, the, the warrant's not been served. Um, and it won't be served until we're ready to bring him back. Boyer has one more murder charge against him right now out of Nashville, Tennessee. Investigators there found a prostitute's body dumped at an Interstate 40 truck stop. Tennessee didn't wait. In 2009, a Hickman County grand jury indicted Boyer on a first-degree murder charge. It's a move Darlington County still has not made. Well, it certainly would lend uh, validity to what the uh, investigator said three years ago if they brought a charge. Criminal defense expert Jack Swirling told us there's nothing stopping Darlington County from pursuing an indictment against John Wayne Boyer. It would, Swirling says, go a long way to showing the public and Michelle Hagenon's family. The sheriff's office is certain they have the true killer. There's been no accountability here in South Carolina, notwithstanding the fact that North Carolina and Tennessee have had a bite at it. So I think they're entitled to, to know what, what's happened here and is this the real killer. And if he's the real killer, uh, then the family is entitled to have that brought here to South Carolina and, and have him convicted for that or, or tried for it. Well, the solicitor here tells me he's advised the Darlington County Sheriff's Office to not serve that warrant on John Wayne Boyer until he tells him to do so. The solicitor is continuing to review the evidence in this case to make a decision on whether anyone will ever face charges in it. Prosecutors took their first look at this case, though, after 14 years when we started questioning them about it last month. As of today, though, no one has ever been charged in the I-20 girl case. In Darlington County, Jody Barr, WIS. News 10. A WIS investigation exposed secrets with a 14-year-old murder case never before told to the public. A man accused of murder. Has he been indicted here in Darlington County? He has not been indicted in Darlington County. Never charged. A confession that doesn't match the evidence. We actually think that he has mixed up details with another murder. The lead investigator resigns days before our investigation aired. For the first time in 14 years, a prosecutor gets his first look at the I-20 girls case file. How difficult do you believe at this point prosecuting this case may be? Till we get all the evidence in, I can't give you a true evaluation on the strength of the case. Now, 14 years later, it may be too late for justice for the I-20 girl. When you have a case that's three years old and, and has not been prosecuted yet, what we argue is the state itself had reasonable doubt. And the mother of the victims demanding answers. I'm disappointed because the people that I trusted most did not do their job. The investigation is reopened and decades old evidence is getting a new look. The question now, will the I-20 girl case ever get to a Darlington County jury? WIS is working to figure that out. Good evening and welcome to our WIS SC Missing Special Report. Last month we aired a series of stories about a 14 year old missing person turned murder case in Darlington County. A woman's body was dumped at an Interstate 20 truck arrest area in the summer of 2000. For more than a decade investigators had no idea who she was and they did not have a single clue as to who killed her. After our investigation aired, the case was reopened and the Darlington County Sheriff's Office restructured. Now we have tracked down new information that law enforcement in South Carolina never had. Here's lead investigative reporter Jody Barr with tonight's SC Missing Investigation. Well, it was almost 14 years ago that Darlington County investigators found a woman's body in the woods here at this Interstate 20 rest stop. The body was called in by a trucker, but that trucker left the scene. What investigators were left with is, as the lead investigator told me, was one of the most complicated murder cases ever investigated in Darlington County. It was a hot, steamy South Carolina summer in August 2000 when Darlington County investigators rolled into this trucker-only rest area. They were looking for a body. Deputies from two counties responded, working to find a body a trucker told dispatchers was lying in these woods. This fence wasn't here, you know, so we got out of the ambulance and walked straight in. Glenda Wilkes was one of two medics who got the call and showed up. We started walking in the woods, so we all stopped and decided that it would be best we split half and half, so half of us went to the right and half of us to the left. 
Wilkes, with a Darlington County deputy in tow, went left. She says the search didn't take long. It's either this tree or that one right there. This is Wilkes's first trip back to the scene in 14 years, but Wilkes says she hasn't forgotten many details. Um, I think I got her. You know, I think I found her. And he came over and, and um, then I removed a little bit. I didn't want to touch anything, you know, so then I moved a few more leaves and he said, yep. So then he called everybody else and told them that we had her over here. The scene, Wilkes says, was so overgrown then, she's surprised they even found the body. Her body was mostly covered up except her hip was up in the air because she was laying on her side and kind of face down. And her hip, we saw the hip. If it hadn't been for that, we'd have never seen her. Yeah. Where were you 48 hours later? 48 hours later, we were right where we were at. I mean, we had a body uh, at autopsy. We had the, uh, the cause of death, um, which was strangulation, um, but we had no information. Andy Locklear was the man leading the investigation into identifying the I-20 girl and finding out what happened. Locklear was a rookie investigator when he got the case, only six months a detective. With virtually no physical evidence to find the killer, Locklear says his first job was to figure out who the woman was. Investigators estimated the woman was lying there for nearly a month. The hot August sun and humidity sped up decomposition, making the woman impossible to identify without matching her DNA to a family member. We didn't have a clue uh, at the time actually what had happened or, or how she died. She didn't deserve that. Belinda Wilkes has passed this rest area hundreds of times since August 2000. Still, the memories from that day, she says, haven't left her. Is this something you were able to pass by here and not think about? Uh-uh. I've always thought when I came by here, I don't think I've ever been by here that I didn't think about her. Investigators had a huge problem in the beginning. But we didn't have a whole lot of answers. Where do you start piecing together a case when you have no idea who the victim is, where she's from, and how she got there? The hard work to put a name to the I-20 girl's face begins. The days after Darlington County investigators took the I-20 girl's body from this Interstate 20 rest area, the work had started to figure out how she got here. Investigators had no clue of who this woman was, where she was from, or who killed her. Darlington County investigators took several years to submit the first DNA sample from the woman's body, the first major delay in identifying the I-20 girl. This rest stop along Interstate 20 in Darlington County is home to a 14-year-old mystery. This is the spot investigators found a woman's body in August 2000, but they did not know who she was. To this day, investigators still have not charged anyone with the murder. Just a copy of everything. Former Darlington County Coroner Eldridge Norton didn't stop working until he could put a name with the I-20 girl. When he retired in January 2001, Norton buried the remains. It would take another decade before he found out who she was. Saw many of them in 20 years. Uh, this uh, was the only unidentified person that I had had in 20 years. How important was it for you to identify who this woman was? Well, and I always felt like uh, she belonged to somebody. Just took interest in it and wanted to keep looking. Number one, you've got to find out who you're dealing with, how did that person get here, and how did that person die? And you're thinking, you know, like you would any other case, it's all gonna fall into place and we'll start getting information, it'll start coming in and, and, uh, and go that route. And, uh, you know, it just didn't happen that way with this case. The lead investigator needed the public's help. Forensic artists used the woman's skull and recreated a clay image of her face. It took weeks to finish and to get this final rendering out to the public. Days turned into weeks and weeks to years. The I-20 girl composite didn't get any answers. When you can't identify a victim, you don't know what the norms are for that victim. You don't know what the routine is for that victim. Does that victim, you know, hang out at rest areas or does that victim, um, is she, a, you know, somebody else that, that was traveling and you start asking a bunch of questions that you can't get answers to. All we knew was we had a body uh, and, uh, and we needed to get some answers. Investigators had one thing and it was a sure thing. It's DNA. Sled agents collected pieces of it from the crime scene, a pathology took a sample from the woman's body. The problem here though, Darlington County investigators waited five years to take that sample from the woman's body to submit it to a Texas lab to begin the work of identifying the I-20 girl. 
Did you have conversations with Darlington County? You know, there were numerous times that, you know, we'd call and the, the, you know, somebody would have to call us back because they couldn't find the file. Um, and I know there was at least two times um, that I sent caseworkers down, you know, to make sure there was DNA entered. Monica Kaysen heads up the Q Center, a Wilmington-based missing persons search group. Kaysen started work on a missing persons file for a Michelle Hagadon soon after Michelle Hagadon went missing in 2000. She knew about the I-20 girl case out of Darlington County, and in 2005, she went straight to investigators to try to help. I submitted then that uh, there was a Jane Doe in South Carolina that I was very interested in concerning Michelle Hagedon. I supplied three pictures never to have been seen by the public to that investigator and asked them, you know, requested at that point that they check into the Jane Doe. There was a striking resemblance and I remember saying that and I actually have notes in my case file um, repeating that. Despite the case and clues, it took Darlington County investigators more than a decade to identify Michelle Hagedon. Coming up after the break. Did you still believe at that time she was alive? No, in my heart, I knew she was dead. After delays in the case, investigators finally found the DNA match to identify the woman known as the I-20 girl. Investigators also got one step closer to identifying a killer. Delays in processing DNA evidence from the I-20 girl file kept Darlington County investigators from identifying this woman for 11 years. In September 2011, the Sheriff's Office announced they'd identified the I-20 girl and a man who investigators say confessed to killing her. Michelle Hagadon was a mother to two children, a girl and a boy. Her family says she fell into addiction, the kind of trouble that leads some into a life of sex for cash. Hagadon, investigators think, chose to do business with truckers. It was a deal that cost Michelle Hagadon her life. It's the whole family. Kathleen Applegate knew Michelle Hagadon well. She's her mother. Applegate spent 11 years wondering where her daughter was. She usually kept in touch, but in mid-2000, the calls stopped. She used to call me and, um, you know, tell me what she was doing and, you know, and then there were no more calls. Applegate remembers getting a call from Brunswick County, North Carolina investigators around 2008. They wanted a DNA sample from her. The county was investigating her daughter's missing persons case. Investigators wanted to see if the I-20 girl was her daughter. Three years earlier, Monica Kaysen, an expert in solving missing persons cases, made the connection for investigators when she handed Brunswick County the clues they needed. I submitted then that uh there was a Jane Doe in South Carolina that I was very interested in concerning Michelle Hagadon. I supplied three pictures never to have been seen by the public to that investigator and asked them, you know, requested at that point that they check into the Jane Doe. There was a striking resemblance and I remember saying that and I actually have notes in my case file um, repeating that. Kaysen says she never heard another word from investigators. The sample Applegate gave in 2008 should have been more than enough to compare, but investigators asked for a second sample. This time from Applegate's grandson, Michelle Hagadon's son. Do you remember how long that took? Over two years. Did they ever tell you why it took so long? They kept it a secret the whole time. From the time they did the DNA, I never knew that they even had the results back. And <clears throat> I, would, I would ask and I got no answer. With two samples already in, Brunswick County took a third, this time from Hagadon's sister. In 2011, investigators gathered Michelle Hagadon's family at the Darlington County Sheriff's Office to announce the family's DNA was a perfect match to Michelle Hagadon. After the break, with the I-20 girl identified, investigators announced they had the killer. And I started explaining my crime scene down here, and it's like, dude, that's the same thing we have up here. So this guy could be the same guy. Investigators made a trip to a North Carolina prison to interview a former trucker. That interview ended with a confession, but it's a confession that did not match the crime scene. With the I-20 girl identified, authorities started work to build a murder case against the man the lead investigator in this case labeled a serial killer. Deputies got a confession from this man, but as we found out through our investigation, the details of that confession do not match the details of this crime scene. 
little teeny pine tree is. Former Darlington County Sheriff's Captain Andy Locklear says the I-20 girl case was the biggest of his career. His reputation was riding on this case, he says, and he needed to solve it. While talking to North Carolina investigators in 2011, Locklear says they led him to a man named John Wayne Boyer. Boyer was a trucker serving time in a North Carolina prison for killing a woman he knew and dumping her body. Boyer was also suspected in other Wilmington area murders, but detectives there admit they did not have anything to tie Boyer to them. He's like, dude, he said, it sounds just like my crime scene. He said, I got a case that I've not charged him with that we think he's a, uh, done, but I don't have the evidence to charge him. Armed with that tip, Locklear decided to visit Boyer in prison. You know, he was um, just, just an evil person. I mean, you could just, you could sense the narcissistic attitude that he had. So, you know, I've always been a, a pretty good interviewer, and uh, I just, just let him talk. Locklear says he finally cornered Boyer into confessing after he tricked Boyer with a statement about the crime scene evidence that was not true. I said, why would your DNA be on this uh, wire, which was what was used uh, to strangle uh, this person? And uh, he looked, sat back in his chair, and... Uh, he actually said at first, he said, my DNA ain't on that wire because I strangled her with my shirt. The autopsy shows Hagadon was strangled with a wire, not a shirt, as Locklear claims Boyer admitted. Locklear says Boyer accurately described some other details of the scene, but the major fact, how Hagadon was murdered, Boyer wasn't even close. Locklear had an explanation. Despite the fact that there were those discrepancies with that confession, you believe John Wayne Boyer is the killer in this yeah, case? Yeah, you know, I mean, with the discrepancies in there, and, and we, we attribute that to confusion. Despite the inconsistencies in the confession, Locklear named Boyer the killer during this 2011 press conference. That day, Locklear promised to have charges filed against Boyer, charging him with murdering Michelle Hagadon. If you were representing this defendant in this case today, what would you argue to a jury about that confession alone? I guess the, the, the bottom line for me would be that if you did not, if your testimony does not match the physical evidence of what they know, then you didn't do it. Jack Swirling is recognized across the state as a criminal defense expert. In looking at the confession and the evidence in this case, Swirling believes it could be in jeopardy. Does that pose a problem? for his defense and the prosecution of this case. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's an enormous uh, burden to overcome. Nearly three years later, we found that Locklear never got a warrant on Boyer. That changed the next business day after we interviewed Michelle Hagenon's mother. Locklear went to a Darlington County judge claiming he had new information in the case and swore out a murder warrant on Boyer. The judge gave Locklear the warrant days before our original reports on this case aired in April. Locklear resigned a week later. Darlington County Sheriff Wayne Bird called what Locklear did a cover-up by getting the warrant ahead of our reports. To this day, John Wayne Boyer still has not been charged, and after our investigation... Like I told you the first time, we just want to seek justice and want to make sure it's done right this time. A solicitor gets his first look at the Michelle Hagedon file, and we're there as investigators meet with the lone witness in this case. With the lead investigator gone, the solicitor tells me he's assigned an assistant prosecutor to the I-20 girl case. There's also a brand new Darlington County Sheriff's investigator assigned to it too. As investigators continue their work to piece together this 14-year-old murder case, there are serious questions now about whether this case will ever make it here to a Darlington County courtroom. For the first time since naming John Wayne Boyer the killer in the Michelle Hagadon case, Darlington County investigators went to North Carolina to interview the lone witness in the case. This is video we shot two days ago. It's South and North Carolina investigators interviewing a man named Jonathan Threat. Threat first spoke with North Carolina investigators in 2011 after Darlington County named John Wayne Boyer the killer. Then last October. That's where she was in. Three told us exactly what he told investigators in 2011. In 2000, he worked with Boyer at a trucking company near Wilmington. They drove together in separate trucks, hauling nails and fasteners to Texas. Three told investigators this in 2011. Whenever we got to this point in South Carolina, 
the 192 mile marker, I spotted a car broke down. It was a little girl in a car. That's when Threat says he got on the CB radio to warn Boyer of the car and the girl. When I look back in the mirror, he was putting on brakes. Threat says he went on to Texas and Boyer stopped. The next day, Jonathan Threat says he saw Boyer again as he made his delivery. He showed up and he was wanting to go ahead of me, but he was all agitated. And I seen the like forehead was sweating. Darlington County believed his story, saying it would support a murder charge against Boyer. His account of that particular time in Mr. Boyer's life was, yeah, they did stop in Dillon. Uh, he went on to Texas. Boyer stopped in Dillon, which corroborated some of that information. In the 14 years since Michelle Hagedon's murder, the solicitors never seen the file until we questioned him about it. That day, he promised he'd have the Boyer file in his office and ordered a full reinvestigation of the case. Two days ago, we watched investigators working the case, re-interviewing Jonathan Threat inside a North Carolina diner. We've, we've made a lot of progress. Um, there's still some kind of loose ends we have to tie up. Uh, we're still um, evaluating the case, and we're kind of, I won't say we're on hold, but there's some stuff that evidence may have to be analyzed that we have to wait on results and stuff like that. Roger says he'll have two choices when he's finished, to decide whether there's enough evidence to charge and seek a conviction against John Wayne Boyer, or whether there's enough evidence to even charge anyone at all. From the way the case was handled so far, criminal defense expert Jack Swirling thinks it could be too late. How would you characterize the handling of this case by the investigating agency from what you know? It appears to me that it was not investigated properly. And I would focus on that investigator. I would focus on what he did and what he did not do. Uh, I would focus on the, the supposed confession and the incredible delay. So the uh, detective's credibility is going to be, to me, the focus uh, of this case. That will be a fact. Is this case in jeopardy? Unless the solicitor is able to pull together uh, credible evidence that he knows would stand the test where some of this other evidence may not, uh, if he can put together that kind of evidence, then he can improve the case. Roger says he's doing everything he can to right what was done wrong in this case. The solicitor admits he's hoping it's enough. There's nothing I can do to go back and change what has happened up to this point. All I can do is, you know, from the time I got involved in the case or our office did, move forward and proceed and do what I, I like doing every case and that's seek justice. The solicitor told me he does not have a timeline on just how long this new investigation could take. He did assure us that he's committed plenty of resources to this case to be sure the decision he ultimately makes will be the right one.